It looks yep. great, Michelle. OK, great. Thank you. OK, so this webinar describes seating evaluation and maintenance. And so we'll go over how to determine if a planting is a success or failure and what post planting steps um, are critical to ensure the best return on your investment. And to let you know, or also as a reminder, this webinar is one in of six in a series here, and it describes this one describes the seeding process. But for optimum success, um, you should reference all of these webinars here and um, and the references that also go along with the webinars and various sources of information. So the series is really designed to be used as a unit and so there's important information in one webinar um, that may be needed to fully understand information in another okay so they just they really uh pretty much build upon each other and so just think of it as a grain drill or like an automobile where numerous parts are needed um, for the drill or the automobile to function successfully okay and if you did not participate in any of these webinars um, last winter or last month, um, I encourage you to view the webinars on the plant materials website. And here's a screenshot showing where you can access the webinar series. So from the um, Montana NRCS website, if you go to topics, and then plants and animals. And then on the left hand side, you click on Bridger PMC TV. Here's where they're all located right here. OK. All righty. So now getting into this session. So as I've mentioned, we're going to discuss evaluating new plantings, as assessing success, and then deciding on the next steps as well. Um, We'll also discuss some necessary post planting management actions that you can do um, that will ensure long term planting success. So it's highly recommended that you read NRCS Conservation Planning Technical Note Number MT-5 Evaluating Seeding Success for Forage and Biomass Planting and Range Planting. And to also familiar, familiarize yourself with this technical note, NRCS technical note, plant materials number 12, guidelines for determining stand establishment on pasture range and conservation seedings, um, as it provides valuable advice and also some good um, kind of how to technical information on evaluating plantings. And so these, there's links to these documents in this PowerPoint, as you can see here. And um, once this PowerPoint gets posted, you can um, just go straight to these links and download these, doc these documents. Um, the documents will be posted on the Montana or the Wyoming State SharePoint sites after this presentation. And so this presentation basically summarizes the information in both of these technical notes. OK. So evaluating planting success. Um, so even though evaluating a planting is not a requirement for certifying a conservation seeding, it is a good idea, um, especially as a new planner, to familiarize yourself with plant species um, and to see how, how each species establishes. And it's especially a good idea if you're um, if you're looking at a certified seeding that's in question. And so also over the years, um, it'll help you develop your knowledge base about various species and, and also successful plantings. And then your knowledge will just continue to grow and develop uh, throughout your career. But as a reminder, um, before you conduct a seeding, there are four steps to success. And, and they are that you planned a seeding, you developed the seed mix, you conducted seeding calculations, and then you prepared and installed the seed bed. 
And this photo here shows a, um, a good seed bed that's nice and firm and it's ready for planting. But first I wanted to talk a little bit about um, why seedings fail. Um, and the, many reasons, there's many reasons why seedings can fail, but some of the primary reasons are failure to eliminate competition from existing vegetation, including weeds, which is what we're seeing right here happening. Um, also a, an improperly prepared seedbed could, be could be a reason. Um, an improperly planted seed, meaning that it's either planted too deep or too shallow. Also excessively deep planting is really the most common issue um, of why seedings fail. So additional reasons are um, failure to protect the seedlings from grazing or traffic um, until they're well established. And also planting seed when conditions are unfavorable. So meaning it's either too dry or too hot, or there's just um, poor seeding timing. And seedings also fail because of um, a lack of adequate soil moisture. This photo here on the right shows a field of cheatgrass. And so this is an example of where you would want to treat the cheatgrass before seeding your desired species. And then going back to the timing of seeding, that also depends on your desired species biology, such as cool season or warm season species. OK, some other reasons why seedings fail. Um, and especially in the early stages of growth are there could be poor seed quality, um, especially with low germination rates. And some seedings have high levels of seed dormancy. And so what that means is that the seed is alive, but that it's not readily, um, it's not ready to germinate until it's provided like adequate conditions that it needs. And sometimes that's like uh, chilling, for example. So improper timing of planting of dormant seeds, you might you might actually conclude that a stand is, is a failure when, when in fact it may just require another year for the seed to break dormancy and then, and then start to establish. Uh, Improper soil and air temperatures could also be reasons why seedings fail. Um, so if the soil temperature is too cold, then with some seeds, the germination can be slow. And but then if air temperatures are too high, seedings might be stressed um, and struggle to establish. So and then this relates directly to the next factor of that, then your seed dries out. Um, and this is this is a common a common reason for establishment failure um, because the seedling has not established a sufficient sufficient root system. This photo here is of fuzzy tongue penstemon, and this is an example of a species that needs chilling um, for seed germination. And actually, right now we have some seeds. Um, in a cooler for fuzzy tongue penstemon because of that. Okay, so some other reasons why um, why seedlings fail is that the seed could be too wet or waterlogged and causing decay or become infected with fungi or other pathogens. And also as shown here in the photo, soil crusting could occur and this is a major concern, um, especially with more of your heavier soils that have relatively high percentage of um, clay and silt and or soils with uh, low organic matter. So if the soil surface forms a crust, then the seedling will have difficulty emerging through this site, this physical barrier that exists. And then also, Toxicity is another reason, and that could be um, allelopathic effects from crop residue and um, 
which can hinder germination and establishment of the seedlings um, by chemical suppression. And then thinking of chemical suppression, also um, herbicide carryover from previous herbicide applications um, can affect uh, seedling establishment. And the degree of um, the severity often depends upon the, the prevailing weather, weather conditions as well. So after a seedling, let's say it's established um, and it emerges, but it can still fail um, because studies have shown that 50% of seedlings that initially germinate will survive in, in the first growing season. So um, some reasons of why that occurs is because of undesirable soil pH. Um, so if that soil pH is suboptimum, seedlings will struggle to obtain their essential nutrients and can become weakened and die. And if the soil is saline or, or has sodic conditions, um, it can inhibit seedling growth. Also, uh, if there's low fertility in the soils, so meaning simply that there's not enough soil nutrition for those seedlings for their optimum growth and health. And then also um, poor soil drainage. So what that results in is a wet, soggy soil, and then there's low oxygen levels. And that encourages fungal diseases, which can then um, cause mortality for your seedlings. So a few other reasons why seedlings fail is, um, or they fail, seedlings, uh, tend to die after emergence are because of drought. And so what happens is that seedlings require water for most of their um, metabolic processes and for their optimum growth. And so a water stressed seedling will only develop, if they're lucky, they'll only develop a small root system and then they're more susceptible to drought stress. So, um, so that can cause failure and also predatory insects. Um, so like the alfalfa weevil, potato leaf hopper, grasshoppers, black grass bug, aphids and others can kill seedlings. And then there's also soil borne diseases um, such as dampening off and phytothalra, which is a root rot that can kill seedlings. So also um, a few others are winter kill or late season frosts. So um, this happens when the seedling is sensitive to freezing. And then also um, pressure from grazing animals can cause your seedings to fail. And then lastly, uh, competition. So competition from weeds or companion crops, um, they can outcompete the seedling for light, nutrients, and moisture. So I know that sounded like a lot, and I didn't want to be um, to come across as too negative, but I feel like once we, we understand what's going on and why seedings fail, then we can um, kind of have our toolbox of what to do to so that they don't fail and so that we can have success with our seedings. Um, and we can make we can make informed decisions, basically. So, so now looking at time of evaluation. So let's say we've made all the right choices in preparing a seeding. Um, I'd like to discuss the timing of evaluating that seeding. Um, so if possible, inspect the planting as soon as you can after emergence. And even though identify, identification of small seedlings can be difficult, like especially with grasses, um, as you can see here, it's like, okay, something's coming up, but I don't know exactly what it is. <laughs> um, that's okay, because um, you can, early evaluation will allow you to recommend a reseeding if the planting <laughs> is an obvious failure. 
OK, so um, you can take some decisive action and you can capitalize on the residual soil moisture um, and recover at least part of the seedbed preparation costs. If you see that it's right off the bat, if it if you're expecting to see seedlings emerge and you're not seeing anything or you've been going back and checking, um, then you can start to make some decisions. So studies have shown that seedlings reaching the three leaf, three leaf stage, um, they had a greater than 90% chance of becoming established on most ecological sites that deemed suitable for seeding. So that's good news. And so a good rule of thumb is stand counts should apply to seedlings with three or more true leaves and an overall healthy condition. And there should be no evidence of insects, disease, or physical damage to the plants, okay? So an evaluation made soon after the initial germination, it gives you options, basically. Um, and then conducting several evaluations throughout the first growing season allows you to develop just a better assessment of what is happening. If you see that, you, that these seedlings are emerging and then they're getting to the three leaf stage or more, you can decide if you deem it successful or if um, you need to go back and continue to check on it. So keep in mind that in the first season, um, stand establishment correlates strongly to the seeding rate. And a planting is best evaluated at the end of the growing season when seedlings are, well, they're easily, more easily to identify. Um, but as I, as I mentioned earlier, if you, when you evaluate soon after the initial germination, it gives you options if, um, if your planting is a failure. And reseeding may be possible or reseeding maybe only in a few areas. Um, may be needed and, and that way you can still salvage um, the seedbed preparation expense. So conducting several evaluations throughout the first growing season, that allows you to develop a better assessment of what is happening. And also keep in mind that in the second season, um, stand counts, they often just decrease and um, and this happens as the seedlings are competing for water, light, nutrients, and space. So what you'll see in the second year will be less plants per unit area, but the plants should be bigger. And seedings should be evaluated for one to three years, if possible, before really determining if, if a seeding is a success or failure. So also keep in mind that the time of evaluation will differ between dry land and irrigated land. And for dry land seeding, uh, it's best to wait until um, the end of the growing season to evaluate. And for irrigated seeding, wait at least 90 days for spring seeding. And then wait six weeks after the growing season for a late summer or dormant seeding. So it's a little bit of differences there. And then um, just keep in mind that your drier areas will respond more slowly than your wet areas. So, so be a little bit patient with those drier areas. So also keep in mind that your species may require two growing seasons to establish. Um, and this is especially true for, for your native species. So a second year may be needed to determine if a stand is adequate. And also be sure to evaluate the stands at the same time each year as growth changes throughout the year. And you, wanna, you want it to be consistent. So now I'm gonna talk about plant density. And this is one of the more important measures in planting success. Um, we call it plant density or stand counts. And what it means is it's the number of established target seedlings. 
and it's also their uniformity and distribution over a site. And it also includes um, if there's any presence of weeds or undesirable species. So keep in mind um, when you're doing stand counts or you're thinking of plant density that native grass species often re require two or more growing seasons to develop what's considered a good stand rate, um, while introduced grasses typically they can produce a good stand in the first growing season. And your the target plant densities, they're going to be um, site specific and most non irrigated ecological sites in the Intermountain West. Um, they're classified as having like a good stand density of 0.5 to 3 plants per square foot. OK, and then for irrigated pastures, um, stand should have a high seedling density of the target species present and should measure at least 50% of the seeded PLS seeding rate. If you don't know what that is, then you can watch one of the other webinars about seeding rates. Um, and so if, if a seeding contains few annual species as you're taking a look out um, onto the site, and the seedlings are uniformly distributed, then it's it's likely successful. So don't be um, don't be discouraged if you see a few of those annual weeds. Um, take a look at the entire site and see, you know, scan it and see what it looks like, because um, then it's likely successful. So a good rule of thumb is the target plant density for rangeland setting should be the total density of mature plants for the key species listed in the ecological site description. So that's something to keep in mind. OK, now this table, <clears throat> it shows the expected seedling densities for successful seedings, uh, which is in the conservation planning te technical note number MT-5. So it shows the number of plants per square foot based on precipitation and the ecological site forage suitability group, um, which is then based on soil type. So this is a good table to get get familiar with. OK. So now that we know when to evaluate a seeding and what success potentially looks like, uh, we'll now discuss uh, some sampling methods. And the reason why we're talking about this is that um, using a standardized sampling methodology helps provide consistent assessments over time from one planting to another. And it also helps landowners move from a subjective qualitative based decision making to more objective quantitative based decision making method. So um, some folks might use photo points, which are really good, um, but after maybe five years it, looking at those photos, it might be hard to really determine, you know, is do we still think it's OK? You know, um, do you'd be really nice to have some notes or some data to go along with this. So um, so that's why I'm moving to more quantitative based method um, is a bit more helpful over time. So I'm going to walk you through one method here. Um, what you can do is you walk in a straight line perpendicular to the drill rows or diagonal diagonally. And then you stop every 10 spaces and then you count the number of live seedlings at the three leaf stage or more that are within a one square foot area or along a one linear foot of dr drill row. And you'll take a minimum of 10 readings per field. And then after 10 readings, you divide the total number of plants by 10 to determine the, the plants per square footage or plants per linear foot. And so also 
you might want to stratify this depending on the topography or other things going on at the site, soil or other variables. So you might want to, if you have a higher area, you might want to take 10 readings in that area and then in a lower area, take 10 readings in that area to determine um, your, your plants per square foot or linear foot. And also, it's really good to take some additional notes specifically on weeds. So, you know, what weeds are on the site and then any desirable non seeded perennials, because that's also good news. Um, and this information will help inform future steps and whether whether they're like immediate steps that you take or the following year. And you know, some of those steps could be, you know, should I apply herbicide to kill the weeds or should we give the like the seeded and the non seeded desirable species some time to establish? And again, here's that same table that I spoke of earlier from conservation planning technical note number MT-5. And um, this will be a good table for you to use as a reference and to help you decide if the planting is a success or not. So after you sample the site, let's say you decide that the planting is a failure. And the next steps would depend on the objectives of the land manager or producer and their contract obligations. So do you replant or do you let natural recruitment occur? You need to decide if the planting will be sufficient as it is um, and that it addresses the resource concern for their seeding contract providing that they have the desired cover and mix of species or if a reseeding is necessary. And I don't want to take this lightly because it's never an easy decision or an easy conversation to have, um, but in most cases reseeding is the best approach. And a rule of thumb here is that for non irrigated sites where stands are rated as failures, they should be reseeded unless natural succession is judged to result in at least fair condition range after 10 years. So the reason why this is recommended is that in the inner mountain west, Russian thistle, tumble mustard, cheatgrass, goat's beard, and western salsify, all these weeds play an important role in weed succession and the abandonment of cropland fields. So typically in year one, what you see, it, it becomes dominated by Russian thistle. And then in years two to three, mustards start to emerge. And three years and beyond, um, cheatgrass dominates the site. So it happens very quickly. So if you elect not to reseed, um, there is a good chance that weeds may persist. Um, and successional data indicates that abandoned cropland could require 25 to 30 years, if ever really, um, to return to a fair condition on its own. So when assessing the potential for natural recruitment, consider the characteristics of the target species that you're looking at and whether it naturally reseeds well or responds vegetatively. And also, of course, you'll need to consider the contract obligations. If they are seeding a CRP field under contract, they have to have a minimum species diversity and be below a specified amount of weed cover uh, within a specified time period. Okay, so now, now we'll discuss a few tips for post seeding management. If the target seeds have germinated and weed competition is excessive, uh, consider treating it, okay? And you can treat it with an appropriate herbicide or you can mow it, um, which will help. It will decrease the shading and the future weed, um, the weed seed development. 
So trying to get those weeds out there and not to um, get those seeds in the seed bank and let them uh, come back, germinate, and then come back next year. Um, early control of the weeds allows the development of a vigorous, healthy stand of your desirable species. So just keep that in mind. Also be sure to protect the planting from grazing um, or traffic until it's adequately established. So it's best to defer grazing to the second or third growing season. And a good way to know um, if if a plant is ready to be grazed upon is if you um, is if you pull on the plant and if it cannot be pulled easily from the ground, grazing can be considered. Also consider fertilizer or, or other supplements to assist seedling growth if you're working on a pasture site, um, though we do not recommend fertilizers on rangelands, okay? And also keep in mind that irrigated seedings require the same management as non-irrigated stands, except the establishment timelines are reduced um, since we're able to provide, you know, the adequate and the optimum supplementary water and nutrients. So also keep in mind that management occurs longer than the seeding and it's integral in the seeding success. So a producer needs to commit their time for the management and it's um, it's really important to have that conversation. Um, the seeding project will only be as successful as their commitment and their action to the management of that area. So just as a reminder here, this presentation um, was based on these technical notes here, um, the NRCS uh, technical note MT-5, evaluating seeding success for forage and biomass planting, and technical note plant materials number 12. And um, we, we recommend you become familiar with both of them. And also this webinar and the previous presentations um, can be found on the Montana and Wyoming, each of your SharePoint sites under the Ecological Sciences um, tab and then Plant Materials. And then they can also be found on the Montana and Wyoming Plant Materials website um, under Bridger PMC TV. And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening to this presentation. And um, I'm going to not share my screen anymore, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have.